You're listening to The Practical Wealth Show with Curtis May. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The uh, Practical Wealth Show. And so who I have with me is a good friend of mine that I met at a conference of last September, I think, uh, Mr. Uh, Kyle Christensen. Kyle is the uh, founder of a tool called the personal financial and a methodology called the personal financial snapshot that uh, he's been helping me implement into uh, uh, our practice. And uh, he's a longtime financial advisor. And matter of fact, Todd, I mean, uh, Kyle, tell him, you tell him. <laughs> what I didn't tell them. Tell them about yourself, and then let's 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 yeah. talk about some. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is is you know uh, principle based planning versus you know uh, financial strategy du-, du jour, financial product du jour. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, great. I started in the financial planning business pretty young. I was in my early twenties in 1999, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's kind of interesting because we're now in what I would say our third major downturn in the market. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know? Um but yeah, so I've I've been doing financial planning uh mostly on the insurance and fixed product side uh my whole career. Mm-hmm. And it's been great. I love it. The system is really a product of a ton of different sources, you know, over my life, over my career. A lot of books, a lot of uh Robert Kiyosaki, a lot of you know, other influencers in, in developing this, this whole, uh, mentality. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's cool. Same here because I, I, I think I got in the industry in 87. I lived through all those same crashes. I got fed up after the last, after 2008, it's like, what am I missing? You know, if another wholesaler tells me, don't worry, the market's going to come back. I'm going to punch him in the mouth. Right. (laughs) (laughs) When we met, this system really spoke to me because I was doing it, but it wasn't codified, you know, in, in like a, here's a paint, you know, here's step one, two, three, four, five. And it was like, ah, that makes so much sense. That is so simple because see, I think that, I think two plus two equals four. And right. I always tell people, this is not that complicated. People want you to think it's complicated because most people's uh, in the financial world, all their advice boils down to basically give your money to us. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I, I think it really comes back to what I call the rules of financial institutions. Tell them about that. If you ask anyone, if you say, hey, if, if you owned a bank, what would you want me to do with my money? They always say, well, I'd want you to give me my, your money. Right. And then we say, okay, that makes sense. How often do you want me to give you my money? And they say, as often as possible, every time you get paid. Right. Right. And then the next question is, is how long would you like to hold my money? How long do you want to hang on to it? And they say, every time they say this, forever, forever. if possible. Right. right. Okay, forever if possible. And, and so then I ask them, do you think it's possible that financial institutions produce products and strategies that are in line with their objectives, with those objectives that we just defined. And they say, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So why is it important that we know that? Why is it important that we understand those rules? I mean, we're not going to change those. It's not like we want financial institutions to suddenly change the the fact that that that's what they want us to do with our money, because they're not going to. But it, it affects, it, or it should affect, the way we play our game with the money. If we know what financial institutions want us to do, and we know that that's what's most heavily promoted, then it's possible that if we do exactly what they want us to do, it's not going to work out very well for us. And it's right. going to work out really well for them. Right. Y'all hear that? That's, that's it. So it's there. We're not throwing them under the bus. They have strategies to benefit them. So you need to know it's hard to win a game when you don't know the rules. Right. And so you're playing by their rules, but their rules set up. Well, I always tell people they create a, a game that where they create the situations, control the outcome so that they profit off of you just playing the game and you're transferring your money to them, your wealth to them. What's interesting is if you flip those rules and you say, hey, would a, would a financial institution 
ever follow their, their same rules that they're trying to get us to follow, right? right? Would they ever put their money in something that they couldn't touch for decades? Would they ever put their money in something where they're not an expert and that doesn't create any cash flow to them? The answer is absolutely no. They would right. never do that. Right. And the reason is, is they have the secret to wealth creation. They know it. These companies that, that Curtis and I work with, that we place business with, they've been around more than 150 years. Right. They know how to create wealth. What we need to know is what they do, not what they're telling us to do. Right. Right. Don't do what they tell you to do. Do what they do. And because the funny thing is, those rules work in personal finance. Absolutely. And they're safer and they yeah. create more liquidity and they create cash flow. And uh, talk about what, what you would consider the, what you, where I, I've got this from you, the ideal plan, the objectives of the, uh, you know, the ideal plan when you're, you know, seeking to make uh, financial decisions. So there's really five basic principles, I think, that, yeah. that help guide an individual and really, this is to know how how do financial institutions play the game? This right. is how they play it. Right. Right. For most of us, we're not inheriting wealth. So for us to ever achieve financial independence, it all starts with one thing, and that's we've got to save money. Right. right. So that's the principle is that we need to save. And not only do we need to save some money, but we need to save enough that it's more than for just the unexpected events that happen, like right now right? There's right. a lot of people that are going to go without income or maybe have a decrease in income for maybe a few months, right? Right. And a lot of them are not prepared for that. And if they, if they have some savings, they're probably going to deplete that. So our, our principle is that if, if you can create a habit of saving 15% or more of your income, then you're going to be saving more than enough, not only for the unexpected events, but you're also going to be saving enough for what you want to do with that money. Okay. So what, what I call opportunity. Right. Okay. And, and we'll come back to that here in a minute. So that's the first principle though. We need to save systematically and automatically 15% or more of our income. Okay. That's our profit. That's the profit from when we go to work and we make money from our job, that 15%, that's what, that's our profit. That's what we get to keep. Right. Right. Okay. George Clayson says in a rich man in Babylon, part of all you earn is yours to keep. That's yep. a philosophy. You have to like, that's the philosophy of wealthy people that you've got to adopt. Not like after I pay my bills, I'll see if I have any money left over. You've got to pay yourself first. Yep. It's got to be the top thing, the priority. So the second principle is maximum protection. So unfortunately in our industry, in the financial planning world, We've been trained by financial institutions. Remember the rules of financial institutions, right? Remember right. that they're creating those rules and they're creating the products and strategies that they want us to follow. Okay. Right. They don't follow, they don't promote the idea of maximum protection. They promote something called needs analysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. So needs analysis, does the word need sound more like the most I could get or does it sound like the least I have to have? The least I have to have. Yep. So need is never the best position I could be in. Now, unfortunately, most, most financial planners are following this and they're promoting this idea to their clients that, hey, you buy life insurance based on how much you think you need, uh, based on predictions of the future. Unfortunately, none of us can predict the future. Not even the smartest one here on the earth can predict what's going to happen to us or to our clients. And so that's not the, the type, that's not what we consider the right plan. The right plan would be to be in the position that you would want to be in if the event you're insuring against or, you, or the event you're protecting against actually happens. So if you get sued because you got in a car accident and you severely injure or kill someone, what kind of protection do you want in that moment? You know, it, well, Utah did. just had their biggest earthquake uh, since 1987. They just had their biggest earthquake just a couple days ago. Uh, how many people at that point in time want earthquake insurance now? Tons, 
tons of people want it right, right. because they're in a lot of their cases, their, their biggest financial asset is their house, unfortunately, right. but right. that's, but that's the truth for a lot of people. Um, and they're not protecting it. So the problem with insurance and protection is that it has to be the way you want it before you know you need it. Okay. And maximum protection, when we talk about uh, life insurance, for example, if I ask a client, hey, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow and you could change your life insurance coverage today, what amount of coverage would you get? And the client always says the most I could get. Right. Well, what is that? Unfortunately, very few outside of Curtis and I and a few others are even telling clients what their maximum is, even giving them the opportunity to take it if they want it. Exactly. Okay. Most financial advisors don't tell them that. Okay. Uh, Life insurance companies have underwriting maximums. Well, every client deserves the right to know what that is. And every client deserves the right to make the choice for themselves if they want that or not. So that's the, that's the second principle. Yeah. Principle number three is full replacement of assets upon death. Most financial planning, again, going with the, the rules of financial institutions, they, they, financial institutions, do they want us to use our money? Do they want us to take our money out of their account? No, absolutely They not. don't. They don't. So if, if they could promote a strategy, if they could promote a strategy, the strategy to you and I and everybody and convince us that the best strategy would be to basically lock up your money so that you really can't touch your money. Okay. Wouldn't that be in their best interest? It would. It would. Absolutely. So this is how they do it. They encourage people to put their money into retirement plans, IRAs, right? Which you can't touch and don't produce any cash flow and are out of a person's control for decades. And then they go to retire and they say, guess what, Curtis, the one thing that was insuring your assets, those retirement assets and all, and your income, we want you to cancel that. And that one thing is called life insurance. Okay. It's really misnamed. It shouldn't have been called life insurance. It should have been called asset insurance because that's what it is. When a person applies for life insurance, the questions on the application don't ever say, what is the value of Curtis? It says, what is the value of Curtis's income? It says, what is the value of Curtis's assets? Okay. So life insurance should have been called asset insurance. So you cancel your asset insurance, which is your life insurance. And then Curtis, you're married. Tell me at what point in time you want to leave your spouse with no assets. At no point. No point. Okay. And so what you're saying is, is that if you if you don't have any life insurance that could replace those assets, what are you going to purposely do with your assets in retirement to make sure your wife doesn't have, isn't left destitute? You're going to try not to spend what you have. You're going to try, you know, live a lesser life and try to conserve your assets. Okay. Does that sound like the retirement you're hoping for? It absolutely does not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And does that I don't sound believe like retirement maybe, anyway, but I absolutely don't believe what I, what I want. I mean, you know, but, Moses but is gonna understand, <laughs> right. But we're, and we're, what we're doing is, is as we talk through this, we're coming yeah. to an understanding of why would financial institutions really heavily promote term life insurance, which you're going to cancel. Right. Okay. And then you're going to self-insure mm-hmm. using assets in retirement. And you just said exactly why. Right. Because there's never going to be a time that you purposely leave your wife without assets. Right. Okay. Exactly. And that is exactly what financial institutions want you to do. So the third principle is that we should always throughout our lives have the ability to replace all of our assets. Okay. If, if Curtis, you went to retire, I know we don't like that word. I don't like that word either, but if you were to go to retire, and you did have enough life insurance that it could replace any of the assets that you might use. What does that do to the pressure on those assets? It alleviates it almost completely. Yeah, because what if you do happen to use half the money while you're both living and then when you die, what's going to happen? It's going to be replaced. It doesn't matter. It's going to be replaced. Yeah. Yep, yep. I call it a tax-free refill. Everybody right. likes re- refills, right? You right, go- right get free refills on, on your, your drink when you're eating in the restaurant, which maybe is a thing of the past at this point. <laughs> right, right. 
but everybody likes free refills. We like tax-free refills in retirement. Okay, everybody wants that. The last prince or, or the fourth principle. Let's go to that. Six months to a year of income storage. I probably can't talk enough about that right now in this environment. Um, you know, none of us want this kind of environment to happen. None of us expected it. Um, but Curtis, I mean, you said you've been in the business since the late eighties, late eighties. You've seen similar things, maybe not this exact same thing, maybe not to this extent, but you've seen this. Yeah. You've kind of seen this story. I mean, in 2008, there were a ton of people who lost jobs and lost their income. And, and, uh, what did they have to rely on? Their yeah. savings. Yeah. Their savings, which were not existent. So then they had to go into their retirement plans because they've been put taught to put all the money in there. And then yep. they've had to take a uh, basically 30% haircut because 10% for the penalty for yep. early withdrawal to get your own money. And then you're going to pay 20% off of the taxes to get the money out. So now you're That's losing right. 30% off from the get go. Yep. It's crazy. I, I, if I know the statistics, if I remember them right, I think it's around 30% of all 401ks have uh, loans against them. Pretty crazy. I mean, People put their money into those accounts knowing that they can't touch those until after age 59 and a half, okay? And yet they still have to. And the reason is, is because they don't have cash. They don't have their liquidity built up. And so, see, when we say, let me, let me just jump in there for yep. a second. Uh, uh, when we say, say 15% of your income, we're not saying put 15% in your 401k because that's not saving. Right. Just that's another clear. thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. If, if uh, if I were selling something that was risky, okay, and I know that the majority of the public doesn't want to take risk, how would I possibly sell it to them? What would I have to do to get people to do it? I'd have to change the, their thoughts around what I'm trying to sell them. Exactly. And so think of how that has been used in the financial industry regarding saving and investing, right? You, you hit the nail on the head. They, we don't call it retirement investing. Nobody calls it that. Right. People call it what? Retirement savings. Re- retirement savings. And the word saving sounds a lot like safety, doesn't right. it? Doesn't it exactly. sound like safe? So it sounds secure. So, right. but, but as securities. we meet with people, right. yes, then right. securities, <laughs> right? I, I always say that they were misnamed. They should have been called insecurities because at the bottom line in, in a perspective that says your money can be lost. Right. And there's nothing secure about it. Kyle and I both like guarantees. If, if we we're in the investment world, you couldn't play a word game to, to get yeah. guarantee to come out of our mouth, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off, but that, that was, I wanted to make sure that when, because people think, oh, I, I put, I put 20% into my 401k. Wrong, right. wrong, wrong. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If people understood that they were actually investing, maybe they would realize, hey, I've got to know something about this. There's risk involved. I, I need to become more of an expert. The word invest actually means to cover completely. Wow. Okay, that's what the definition of the word invest means. The word gamble means you, you're putting some money at risk for a possible gain. Isn't that what people are doing? Yes. People are gambling. They're not really investing. And they think they're saving because that's what the financial industry has told them they're doing. Right. Okay. And everybody else is really doing saving. it. Right. And everybody else is doing it. So, and so if I always tell people, if you're in Warren Buffett, they go, yes. I said, well, Warren, you ever heard of Benjamin Graham? Uh, no, who's that? That's Warren Buffett's mentor and an intelligent investor. Uh, yeah. He says that investment is something you put your money into where your principal is safe. Right. Yeah. And you have a reasonable opportunity to make a profit. Anything that doesn't meet that criteria is speculation, i.e. Yeah. gambling. And I'll yeah. ask people. So now hold that up with what you've been hearing on the news waves. And you are. What are you doing? Are you saving, speculating or gambling? You know, speculating, and gambling, the same thing. Or are you investing? You're not even investing. You're gambling. Yeah, so you might as well go to, uh, to I tell people to the casino, the Harris or whatever, and at least you get dinner. In a, yep. a show. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You, you like the roller coaster. Right. You know, you like the thrill of the ups and downs. Uh, but that's what gambling is. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. The money that we're saving, principle number one, should be going into something that has these three characteristics. It should be guaranteed. It should be liquid. 
In other words, it is cash already. Okay. And then the last characteristic is that it should be accessible, liquid, guaranteed, accessible. Right. Okay. And that, that helps clients know, well, what qualifies, you know, what, what kind of account can I put that into where it has those three, three characteristics? Okay. That's really saving. Okay. Right. right. Now we've all heard the phrase cash is king, right? Everybody's heard that cash is king. There are two sides to the interest rate coin. There's the side of people making money, making interest, and there's a side of people paying interest. And this is where principle four comes in. If people don't have enough in savings, if they don't have enough liquidity, then they are going to be paying interest their whole lives. The people who have enough money, the reason cash is king is because the very best opportunities that exist require cash. Okay. And people who have cash are also ready for unexpected life events, which are going to happen. We should expect the unexpected because it's going to happen. Right. Okay. And so if we don't want to pay interest to financial institutions our whole lives and we want to make interest, then number four, principle number four is absolutely key. And yeah, some people will say, well, it's going to take me a long time to build up six months of income storage. You know, well, the very worst investments that exist don't require any cash. You don't have to have any patience. You don't have to have any deferred gratification. They, they package it. They polish it. They make it look really awesome and easy. Okay. They love the word easy. Okay. And in fact, they make it so easy. You don't have to know anything. Right. Okay. But tell me in your life, what, what have you been able to do that's successful and enduring that required no effort, no knowledge, no deferred gratification? Tell me what part of your life was really successful that didn't require those things. I can't think of a thing. There isn't a thing. Yeah. It doesn't exist. That. It's nothing. It doesn't, it's just no, you know, you working and hoping some fund manager is really smart and you're betting your life on that. It's foolish. We can talk about all the places when we meet with our clients, we tell them all the places that qualify for those three things. And there isn't one single place where that money should be. Uh, there's a, there's a spectrum of convenient access, right? Right. You know, maybe the most conveniently accessible is in your house, right? Right. You have cash in your house. Good. You should have some there. Okay. Maybe the next place is the checking account. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the problem with, with most convenience, okay. With convenience comes a what? Comes a price. Right. Okay. And there's a cost. There's a cost to keeping all your cash in your house, right? What's the cost? <laughs> you know, opportunity cost, interest rate cost. Yeah, you're not making any Yeah, there's money. no interest. You're yeah, not making no interest, any money. Right. Yeah, right. there's no additional protections, right? Somebody could actually steal your cash. Right, right. right. And then it's gone. There's no in- homeowner's insurance doesn't say, hey, we'll replace all your cash in your house. Right. Okay. Or you're saying oh, for what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you give up some things. So for a little less convenience, maybe you can get a lot more protections. And that's some of the things that we talk about. We won't use this conversation to talk about that, but, right. but uh, yeah, there's great tools out there for that. All right. Principle number five, velocity of money. So, so again, we've got to go back to the rules of financial institutions. They're encouraging us to invest in things that we don't know, that we don't understand, that we give up control for long periods of time, okay, that produce no cash flow to us by design. They're purposely designed not to produce cash flow to us. Right. Okay. That's what they're promoting. Yet they would never do that. They want to invest in something that they are experts in, that they retain as much control as possible, and that produces what? Back to them. Cash flow. Cash flow. In fact, that's what matters the most to them. If you talk to any successful business owner or any successful real estate investor, what do they know? Do they know the value of their business? Very few business owners know the value of their business. No. But what do they know? They know how much they're making. They know how much they're they're net. You know how much they're grossing and they know how much they get to take home. Yep. That's right. They know the cash flow. Okay. They have to know the cash flow. And that's actually the most important thing. Okay. It's, but it's funny because the financial services industry has told us to focus on what? The value. Uh, The value of your assets. (laughs) Yeah. 
uh, net worth, you know, how much you have in your, in your, you know, account, which at any given day doesn't mean anything because you, you can't, yeah. you, you know, you can't eat equity. Somebody told me. Yeah, and in <laughs> fact, I remember, I remember uh, ING, I think it was ING that did the commercials that what's your number, you know, and right, people right. were carrying around their number They're, They have done such a great job of convincing the public that that's what they should focus on. Right. It's like it's like a magician. Right. The magician's whole goal is to try and get you to focus on something else while they're doing their trick. Right. Right. Uh, and, and that's what the financial service industry has done. They've said, look, Curtis, what you need to focus on is the accumulation value or the, the value of the account, not the cash flow, even though that's exactly what's important to them. That's why, and, you know, there's no financial education. You know, Kiyosaki talks about there's no financial education in schools. And, yep. um, you know, I'll, I'll do workshops for kids. I'll say, I'll say, well, you know, I'll start out, you know, if you want to learn a new language, this language called money, you have to start with the vocabulary, you know? So I yep. just draw the boxes, income, expense, assets, liabilities. And I'll say, what's an asset? Oh, it's this, or you own that. I said, no, it's something that puts money in your pocket every month. Yeah. Cash flow without you working. Yep. Okay. Without your labor. Okay. That's cash flow. What's a liability? Something that takes money out. And I'll say, well, Based upon that definition, what is a house? Liability. These are 15-year-olds now. After I've just yeah. broke it down for them, 15, 16-year-olds. Yeah. And uh, what's a car? A liability. I said, unless you drive for Uber? Yes. Now it's an asset because you're generating cash flow. <laughs> See, so yep. you know what I mean? You gotta, you have to look at it and you have to get through the noise of what I call the financial entertainers. Because yep. this, this is really, that's why, you know, I always tell people two plus two is four. This, they think, well, I don't know. I don't understand money. I don't understand numbers. It's not that complicated. You're, you're just taught to think it's complicated because their favorite, you know, what everything that we're talking about is basically goes back to their four rules and basically give your money to, up, to us. That's the total of their marketing. Absolutely. So the, the word that, that Curtis and I like to use instead of retirement is financial freedom. Yes. Okay. Those are the words we like to use. Financial freedom, because what financial freedom means is that you are getting enough cash flow from your assets that you could live on that, that you can maintain your lifestyle. Right. That's where you're you're reaching financial freedom. Retirement means that you quit your job, that you're done working, that you're done being productive. That's why we don't like that word. Right. Uh, financial freedom is about reaching a point in time where you're working because you choose, not because you have to. Okay. Now, how do financial institutions get there? You know, some people think that when they get a mortgage, that the, that the lender cares about the interest rate that's being paid on the mortgage. That is totally false. Right. They don't care about that interest rate. <laughs> what do they care about? We've already talked about it. Right. The cash flow. You make cash payments. flow. Right. Cash flow. That's what they care about. If they cared about keeping the loan, why would they ever encourage us to refinance our house? They would never do that, especially as interest rates are going down. But man, they are totally excited as the interest rates go down. Why is that? Because it brings, they, they have thousands of dollars in fees and closing costs. And on average, the average American either sells their house or refinances every five years. Right. Okay. So no one could convince me that financial institutions, lenders care about the loan. What they right. care about is the cash flow and they care about doing it over and over again. Right. And collecting those fees over and over again. Okay. It's about velocity of money. The velocity of money, the, that term is, is about the multiple uses of money. So the more uses of the same dollar that you get throughout your lifetime, the greater the velocity. Okay. Robert Kiyosaki in, in, uh, who took my, my money. money. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. He said, he said that he cares more about the velocity of his money than the rate of return. And I don't think most people even have a clue what he's saying when he says that. I'm sure they don't. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> which is crazy because Robert Kiyosaki does a fantastic job pretty much throughout all of his books in explaining things in simple terms. And that's why they're so successful. Right. But that one phrase, I, I was so excited when I read that and I thought, exactly, that's exactly right. 
He cares about the uses of his money. He cares about the cash flow, getting another use over and over and over again throughout his lifetime. That's actually what creates wealth. That's what financial institutions do to create wealth. That's what the wealthiest people in the world do to create wealth. They don't put their money somewhere that doesn't produce cash flow, that they're not experts in, that they give up control. If you read The the Millionaire Next Door, control is the most important factor okay, in explaining economic success for mi- most millionaires in America. Wait, it's not their stockbroker or their, yeah, their financial exactly. advisor? <laughs> yeah. That was pretty low on the list, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's why. So we go back to what do I, you know, you've heard me say this on the show. I'm going to keep like running this in the hole, but your number one asset is you, right? And right. so you have to invest in your mindset, you know, your philosophy or Jim Rohn calls it how to learn how to set a better sale. You've got to yeah. invest in your skill set. Your being able to create value in the marketplace is what makes money, right? Yep. And then your network so that when you have the skills, when you aim those skills at people you can solve a big problem for, you can yep. get a big check. Yep. Then that leads back into principle one, say 15% of that or more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Give him an example of velocity. I, I, I read something where I've talked about it from the, my pen was in a tavern industry. And you talked about it from a grocery store uh, perspective mm-hmm. of not leaving stuff on the shelf. Can you, can you share, maybe give them an idea of velocity so that we can be clear on that and then we can bring it back to money? Yep, absolutely. Um, one way to, I, I think it's important to, to look at it from this perspective too, to start with that financial institutions try to get us to do what, what I call one use products. Yeah. Okay. So in other words, you put your money into something and it has a designated single purpose. Okay. And if you use that money for any other purpose, they're going to penalize you. Okay. Give you some easy examples. 529 plan. Mm-hmm. What's that designed for? College. Only Higher yeah. education. Yeah, higher Can't education. Use, mm-hmm. If you use that money for anything else, what happens? Taxed and penalized. Yeah. Okay. How about retirement plans? All of them. 401ks, 403bs, Roth IRA, you know, traditional IRA, all of them. If you use that money for any other purpose, what's going to happen? Taxed and penalized. It's a single use purpose, right? Health savings account. I actually kind of like a health savings account, but it's a single use purpose right? It's designed to pay for medical costs. That's it. Right. Okay. If you try and use it for other things like a vacation with your family, you're going to pay a penalty. Okay. So that's what financial institutions want us to do. Okay. But real wealth is not created that way. We don't have enough money. Most of us have limited resources. And when I say limited, we don't have, we can't print money. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you go to jail. Right. (laughs) Everybody, but you know, the banks and the Fed, right? Yeah. So. so if we actually followed what traditional or what I call traditional planning suggests, okay, they suggest all of these single use products, you don't have enough money to do it all. So right. you've got to have what I call a Swiss Army knife, right? You need a Swiss Army knife financial product, right? Or financial mentality. You've got to have that one product or that one account be able to do multiple things, okay? When we put our money into something, our goal with our clients is to help them retain control, access, and use of their money throughout their lifetime. I'll give you an easy example. Okay, Real estate is probably one of the number one. It is close to the top uh, re- way that most people create wealth in the, in the world. Okay, And this is how they do it. They save money somewhere that's liquid, accessible, and guaranteed. Yep. And they're prepared. And when the opportunity comes along that they can take advantage of, they do. They take advantage of it. And what are they hoping to get from that property? Do you, do you think they just want the one property? That's it? No, absolutely not. It's never it. Okay. No. So they put their money in there and then they buy a, uh, they invest in a property that from day one produces cash flow, positive cash flow. Okay. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki talks about that all the time in his books. It, it's an asset. If if you if it doesn't produce cash flow, it's not an asset. Right. Okay. It's a liability. So it produces cash flow. What do they do with that cash flow? Save they put some it back. of it. They put yeah, it back. They, they, they replace the, the account. account. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So think about that. 
So let's say that I had $20,000 in the account that I used to invest in the property. That was my down payment. As I get $20,000 back in positive cash flow, that goes back into my bank account, right? Yeah. What happens to my risk of my money once I've gotten $20,000 back from that investment? What happens to my risk? It's, it's gone because you've got all your original capital back. Yep. So if I do what financial institutions want me to do and I put my $20,000 into something that purposely doesn't produce cash flow for the next 30 years, how long do I carry the risk? 30 years. 30 years. Okay. <laughs> Until I get my money back, right? So that's an interesting point. But now I'm going to take that $20,000 and and I'm going to add it to the money I've I've been saving from my normal day job, right? Right, right. And so now I have more than $20,000. And when another opportunity comes along, I'm going to take advantage of that, right? So now right. I've got that same 20000 bucks that I put in the first property. And now it's going into another property. Okay, that's also producing positive cash flow. And now I've got two assets producing cash flow back to me. Where am I going to put that cash flow? Back into my uh, original account so that I can look for other opportunities. Yep. And so I'm going to just keep repeating that process over and over again. It's like a grocery store, okay? A grocery store's intent is not to sell, not to fill all the their shelves with goods and sell them one time. Right. Okay? That's not the grocery store's mentality. It's not the auto dealership's mentality, okay? Their mentality is, I'm going to sell that can of beans, okay? And I'm going to make a little profit on it. I'm not going to try and make a killing on that can of beans. I'm going to make a little profit on that. And that little profit's going to cover my expenses. And I'm going to get enough money that I can buy two cans of, of beans. Right. Right. And I'm going to put two cans of beans on the shelf now. Okay. And so as I do this process over and over again, I get what's called a multiplier effect. Okay. And we saw that with the real estate. Went using the same money, I ended up with two properties. I right. started out with just one. And if I keep doing that process, I'm going to get more and more properties, right? Same thing with the grocery store. They're going to fill that shelf over and over again. And as they do that, their cash flow multiplies. Okay. They can use the same money over and over again. And they can even at some point take their cash out of the game so that they don't even have any capital at risk anymore. And all they're doing is, is they're filling the shelf now with profits from from products that they bought using their original seed money. Right. So that's actually what creates wealth. That's that's what all successful financial institutions do, but they're not teaching us to do. I if you ask them people, nobody would would know that. They they think like I people say, well so and so's a a a wealth management. We were talking about a wealth management conference I went to, right? But right. The the re, the people are just managing the wealth that was created by velocity, and they there and so what happens is they actually talk business people that made money in their business creating velocity, following what, what you just talked about and what we talk about, and then there because of the marketing, if you don't have enough information to understand that's not in your best interest, you're going to still fall back into that that pattern, giving your money away to people that, you know didn't work for it and hope they can create some magic profits for you. Yep. Yep. I mean, the bottom line is why don't financial institutions promote velocity of money? Well, number one, they don't want us to have access and use of our money because they want access and use of our money. So they create okay. velocity for themselves. Yep. That's right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh-huh. But if our, so, so I agree with you a hundred percent. Our client's best investment is them. It's themselves. It's their own ideas. It's their own products that they can come up with. It's their own property that they can control and own. Okay. Why doesn't the financial services industry promote that? It's because they can't get paid on it. Right. Okay. If you invest in your own business, if you invest in your dental practice and you uh, add an associate and you, you know, expand the, the square footage of your office and you do those things, the, the financial services rep can't get paid on that. He, he doesn't get a piece of that pie. Right. Right. And so they're not going to try and promote that. What they want to promote are things where they, they're going to get a fee or they're going to get a percentage of the money 
over time every year. Because what are they caring about? What are they what are they concerned about? Cash flow. Cash flow. To them. Right. To them. Right. Right. And so that's, you know, what's so powerful and what turned me on so much about, you know, I, I had been thinking like I work, I'll talk a lot to real estate investors and um, business owners. Right. And so a lot of times they'll have traditional or, or what, what Kim Butler likes to call typical financial advisors are always trying to get them to put their money in, you know, solo 401ks, you know, take money out of their business. And they inherently feel there's something wrong with that, but then nobody validates for them, right? Yep. And then I find that people are s- skipping to step five, right? You know, like I'll hear people, I'll go to these real estate investment groups and they're like, well, I got to, uh, well, are you saving any money? No, that's why I got to do this flip. That's why I have to do this, this wholesale deal so I can get some money so I can save. And I'm, why can't you save now? Are you working? And yeah, and, you know, so they're, they're, they're trying to skip steps and they put themselves more at risk because you, if you don't have the savings, now you're looking to hit a home run in step five because you're trying to make your money do too much because you're skipping principles, you know? And so what I like about the five principles, it's just like football or you got to learn how to black and tackle or basketball. You got to learn how to have good fit work. You got to learn how to pick and roll. You got to learn the fundamentals and then you can, you know, we both play basketball, but then you can do other stuff. You got to have learn your offense, and then once you have your offense, you can you know you can improvise from there. But you've got to have the the you know the foundation. People say, "Oh, what did I invest?" In? I say, "Well, do you, how much you have in saving? Nothing. You can't invest. Yeah, you know, three months is your emergency fund, and past that, maybe it's an opportunity fund, and you can start to do some stuff. But you need to invest in." what I call it in step five, what I call little things, you know, uh, network marketing, you know, little side hustles that you can get into running $500 to create new money. That's velocity. Yep. And what you know? they can, what they can invest in, uh, even if they don't have any money is their education. Yes. Because they can go to a library and I mean, we live in the information age, so yep. we have more information accessible to us than in any time in the history of the world. And so all of these books, you know, that we've been kind of mentioning and stuff like that, that's available. They can yep. go to the library and read them for free. Yep. A lot of times right? they're on YouTube. Somebody put the yep. audio book on Rich Dad Poor Dad's on yep. YouTube, you know, or Jim yep. Rohn. And, and so, but you got to, one of the things that we, would you say that most people are, they are trained to be, you got to go get it, folks. Nobody's going to sit there and, and, and give it to you. It does take work. There is no magic yeah. product right. that's going to take you to glory. You know, no, none exists. I don't care who tells you what. There's no, yeah. you know, uh, we, we, before we were talking, we had this debate on, you know, there's this really popular, you know, uh, funny insurance product out there that people are thinking it's like a magic box. And it, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's risk in it, but a lot of people that market it don't even really understand it. You know, well, that's yep. another show, but, yep. uh, you know, but if you learn these principles, uh, now you're posi- and you educate yourself. See, the thing is, if you're saving and you've got money accumulating and you're educating yourself at the same time as, you know, uh, a mentor of mine, Nelson Nash used to say, listen, if you have cash opportunities will find you. Yeah. Absolutely. And I I was just thinking about, as you were talking about that, you know, the pathway of least resistance Mm -hmm. or the easiest path, another way of thinking about that, always leads down. It never leads up. Right. That's right. So think about that with your wealth. Think about that with reaching financial freedom. The, The easiest pathway cannot take you there. It doesn't ever lead there. It only goes downhill. <laughs> it only goes so, down. Right, it only right, goes right, down. Right. And, right. and ultimately, what it leads to is dependence. Yes. And none of us want to be in that position. None of, none of us want to be in the position of, hey, I'm really hoping the government bails me out. You know, I'm really hoping my family bails me out. I'm really hoping my church will bail me out. Now, I love the fact that those things are there. We need safety nets in our society. Okay. But we, would, we should not intentionally put ourselves on that path. Right. Right. And that's, and we can choose, we don't have to be on that path. We can choose to be on the path of financial independence, 
but that's going to require work, effort, knowledge, right? And that's what we've been talking about. It's, it's the, it's uphill. That's how we get there. And it's a choice. So everybody, if you're hearing this, you can do this. We just laid out five principles. We haven't mentioned any products now yeah, or, or anything. It's really principles first. And there are tools that can help aid you in the principles. But you've got to be talking to somebody that understands the principles so that they can, you know, because it's like where it's like in, in planning, it's like, okay. It's your goals. Where do you want to go? Right. And then it's first thing you got to do with a GPS. You got to figure out it needs your current location to get you yeah. to the point where you got to go. So you've got to, you know, take assessment of, of, of where you are, what you got going on. And that's basically what, you know, Kyle and I uh, both do with, with clients. That's what our personal uh, financial snapshot is all about where where we know where you want to go. We're going to help you. You might not even know where you want to go. We're going to help you kind of codify that, but you've got to figure out where you are because if you want to create maximum wealth, it's not about finding better investments that pay a higher rate of return because that really leads to more risk and loss. It's about becoming more efficient with your money and yep. minimize the losses. And uh, that's that's really, you know, our, both our focus is how can you become more efficient? How can you minimize taxes? How can you minimize fees? How can you, uh, you know, the top, I just call them wealth transfer. The top five wealth transfers are how you pay your mortgage taxes, how you fund your retirement plans, how you pay for educational expenses, and how you pay for major capital purchases. There's more money lost in those five things I just named than you'll ever make trying to pick winning investments. So you, yeah. I told people, if you got a bucket and it's got holes in it, I think the first step would be to plug the holes, not to turn up the volume of the water. <laughs> right. But that's what the industry would have you believe because of their first, it goes back to the first four rules. My pastor yeah. used to say, listen, I don't mind you having self-interest. I just want to know what they are. <laughs> right? And exactly. so you've got to know they have self-interest. What are they? Be aware of them. And then, but you got, because if you don't have a plan, you part of somebody else's plan and their plan is not set up to benefit you. I mean, that's really the purpose of knowing the rules of financial institutions is, is if we know that that's what they want and we know that they're creating products and promoting strategies that get them what they want, we don't have to play the game they want us to play. Right. Because if we do, there's only one guaranteed loser. Right. That's you. That's right. me. Right. Right. And so if if we want to succeed, we have to know what they're doing and do that and not what they're telling us to do. Boils down to the, uh, and I, I think I coined this phrase from you, the accumulation theory mm -hmm. versus the velocity method. Yep. And we've been talking about the velocity method, which is based, based on principles, your knowledge, you're getting good at something and finding something that you understand that makes sense, that can generate a profit and cash flow, right? And where everything up by term invested difference, there decreased responsibility, you know, buy and hold, dollar cost, ad, all that is what you think is real stuff is based on accumulation theory, you know, tax-free retirement, all those catch words you hear out there. And it's all based on hoping, it's all based on the stock market, which we've just told you that is not Investing is gambling. So you get me excited now, Todd. So I'm, I'm going to calm down and take a breath. <laughs> I'm upset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, it, that's, that's really what it boils, boils down to. The accumulation method is promoted most heavily. It's yeah. by far the most prominent planning method that, that exists out there. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason that financial institutions love it and promote it. And it's because it accomplishes what they want. Right. It for accomplishes them. what they want us to do. Right. Right. And there are products that are designed specifically for that method. Those are the products that we want to identify and that we don't want to participate in. Yeah. And that's, you got to identify them and then you've got to buy stuff or, 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 you know, in, cr as you create your plan, then you've got to find stuff that helps you become more efficient, helps you have more liquidity, use control, access, safety, guarantees yep. with your money. And then you build your foundation around that. 
Yep. And it's a lot, you know, a lot of people might say, well, you're telling us about a lot of things, what not to do. And, and I want people to, to realize that that's not a bad thing. Right. You know, Thomas Edison, as he was trying to invent the light bulb, right. He went through a lot of what didn't work and he actually got excited every time one didn't work because he knew that that was one step closer to finding the solution. That's half the battle, you know, when it comes to success financially, it really is knowing what not to do in a lot of cases. Right, right, which is a product of education. And, uh, you know, Dan Sullivan uh, says that, you know, most people have, you know, it's it's called the ceiling of complexity. So most people, when it comes to finance, that ceiling is low. And so you're hitting, your ceiling is low, you're hitting your head against the ceiling of your knowledge and it causes frustration and panic. And, you know, uh, I remember in Rich Dad Poor Dad, he says the two things that are driving people are fear and greed because of their lack of knowledge. Now I was yeah. rereading Rich Dad Poor Dad, that jumped out at me because I somehow I didn't see that before, you know, fear and greed. And so as your knowledge goes up, your anxiety comes down and you can, you know, so even in the midst of all this craziness that's going on, as we record this, you know, COVID-19 is going crazy and are keeping people shut in and all this crazy stuff. But on the other side of crisis, the Chinese symbol, there's opportunity. If you can keep your head, if you're liquid and, you know, so we, you know, we challenge you to use this time to educate yourself, to get your affairs in order, to learn how to create multiple streams of income, to learn how to, uh, uh, you know, work from home, as I'm recording this, I'm here in Philly and Kyle is in, 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 in Salt Lake, but we're getting work done. Yep. And that's what you got to learn how to do. Todd, any, any, uh, any good things you're uh, reading uh, that they should look at and any closing words of wisdom as we bring to a close? I thank you so much for sharing with our audience today. Well, I appreciate you inviting me, Curtis. And uh, it's awesome. I mean, I, I'm passionate about this. I love it. Um, it's interesting that we're talking about principles-based planning, and I, I uh, bought Ray Dalio's book, uh, Principles of Life and Work, which is a fantastic book. And uh, I love what he says right at the beginning. He says, without principles, we would be forced to react to all things life throws at us individually, as if we were experiencing each of them for the first time. If instead we classify these situations into types and have good principles for dealing with them, we will make better decisions more quickly and have better lives as a result. I love that. I love love that. that. And then he says also, all successful people operate by principles that help them be successful. And I think that that's key. Uh, You know, that's what we're talking about is, is this really is the right way to do financial planning. It isn't predicting the future because we can't do that. Uh, it's not doing what financial institutions want us to do. It's doing what they do right. um, and helping our clients understand what that is. And I love it because it works. We've seen our clients have great success. And uh, like Curtis said, actually, before we started recording, our clients aren't losing money right now. Right. You know, what they are doing is they're kind of licking their chops right now because there's going to be huge opportunities and they're positioning themselves to be able to take advantage. That's right. Guys, I'm going to have a link in the show notes. So if you'd like to, uh, you know, have a 15 minute uh, uh, talk about, you know, uh, I'll send you a, if you email me, curtman at gmail.com, I'll send you, uh, I'll, I'll probably have a landing page in the notes. I just haven't created it yet. A report called the value of liquidity. And if you'd like to see what a personal financial snapshot looks like, then uh, reach out to me on the, on the link and then we will, you know, kind of help show you or I'll show you how to get these five principles working in your life. Some of you are doing some of them now, but you need to tweak them, but you don't really have them in order. And that's what you want to make sure so that you're bulletproof. So when life comes at you, you're protected. Awesome. Love it. Thanks again, Curtis. All right. Thank you. you guys have a great day. Go out there. Be safe. Be prosperous. Don't panic because this too shall pass.
Thanks for listening to Practical Wealth. To access the show notes and resources, go to practicalwealthshow.com. To get your questions on the show, go to practicalwealthshow.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before you make any investment decisions, consult a professional. This show was copyrighted by Practical Wealth. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.